And then for the first time since the summer to push, we take off our gloves and our boots and then we discover we've got all this frostbite to fingers and toes and it's really not looking good. And we've got a one-month walk from base camp to the end of the road. <laughs> I get to base camp mid-afternoon and John gets to base camp... Um, Probably about five o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. And then for the first time since the summer to push, we take off our gloves and our boots and then we discover we've got all this frostbite to fingers and toes and it's really not looking good. And we've got a one-month walk from base camp to the end of the road. <laughs> and there's no way we can do it with these frostbitten feet. So what does a frostbitten foot look like? When you take off your shoes, what do you see? Is it all just black? or In the early stages, it's purple and blue. Right. But you can't move your toes because they're frozen solid. If you moved, you try, if you tried to wriggle your toes with your fingers, you'd snap your toes off like pencils. Oh, Jesus. So it wasn't looking good. And then it, as the days progress after you get frostbite, it becomes light blue to purple... And then it goes all black, like the colour of your T-shirt. Wow. And, and the pain slowly increases during that And pain? The, the pain doesn't increase. The pain increases from the area around the frostbite. Right, where the nerve endings are still yes, kind because of... because frostbite is just like a burn. Yep. You have first degree, you have second degree, and you have third degree. Third degree means the cells are dead, right. whether it's heat or cold. Second degree... And I'm not a doctor, so I'm just talking basic yep. principles here. Second degree, it's like sitting on a fence. Yep. The cells can go either way. They might recover, they might die. First degree, the cells will recover. Yep. So I pretty much had the first third of both feet at third degree frostbite because they turned all black. Uh, John's feet weren't too bad. He had black, uh, black big, two big black toes and a couple of toes either side of the big toe, but he had lost a couple of gloves on his right hand, a couple of pairs of gloves on his right hand, so his right hand had frostbite uh, quite badly, and as a result he would lose the tips of his uh, index finger and... Middle finger. Middle finger. Yep. The first joint and half of his pinky or little finger. I had frostbite on my right hand, uh, which was quite bad, second degree. So my fingertips were black back to about here. Wow. And as you can see, my right thumb was black back to the, to the yeah. joint here. And yep. subsequently, I would lose about 10 millimetres yeah. off the end of my right thumb. Right. And I have no thumbprint on my right thumb. Right. Uh, so but the rest of my fingers were fine. So you're at base camp. And your feet are, are, you've discovered this. You can't walk around base camp, can you? No. It's not like you can stroll to, to use the bathroom or anything no. at this time. So we have to have our base camp staff carry us to the toilet because we can't walk. And neither can we walk the, the one month out to the road. So you're pretty much just laying in your tent at this time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we had to get rescued, which was... Uh, we had uh, a cook and three kitchen boys at base camp. So we asked one of the kitchen boys to go out to the end of the road and find a radio or a telephone, radio our agent, Nima, in Kathmandu and see if he can arrange for a helicopter to pick us up at base camp. <coughs> so off he goes. And he's got to run. He's going to run yep. this one month walking in a week. <laughs> Every day he's going to run, 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 and then just camp in a village <laughs> oh that night, God. get up early next morning, run, run, run the next day. Anyway, he gets to a village that's got a phone or a radio, I don't know which. And, and then if he trips and breaks his leg along the way... And disappears. That's, that's you done. Well, more, well, we've got to feel for him too. Yeah, I mean, yeah of course. Because he's so. in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, we can survive at base camp for a little a bit longer. What sort of terrain is it? 
that he was going through. Rugged, and bear in mind that on s- in the last few days, the last week or so to get to base camp, we had to build our own bridges across rivers because that's the only way we can get across these rivers. And when I say bridges, it's just like <coughs> a couple of sticks. or It's a couple of logs yeah. that have fallen from one side of the, cr- <laughs> the creek to the other side. Wow. And they're slippery and there's no ropes and you just wow. got to get across them without falling off. So he's run off and, and got to a town. Cold? Super cold? No. Uh, well, in the first couple of days from leaving base camp, it would have been cold, but he would have run the he would have run that distance. So he would have got out of the cold in the first couple of days, right. in the first day or so, and got into the forest. Yep. <coughs> and so, how long are you at base camp, and when do you first hear that he's made it? Or so, not only does he have to run out and and radio Katmandu, he has to get clear a clear clarification or message to come back. Mm. And so he does. So for thankfully, my our agent Nima in Kathmandu says, yes, I'll arrange a helicopter. What time do you think it should come in? Because he's still got to get back to base camp to tell us. Yeah. So we he, esti- he, esti- he estimates the time... And, and then everything's agreed that the helicopter will come in on this day. And then he turns around and has to come back to base camp, which he does. And he, he says to me, yep, the helicopter's coming. So, but we're too high for a helicopter pickup. We are talking the 80s. Yep. So helicopters can't fly much higher than 5,000 metres, let alone stop and pick up two, two climbers. Mm. So we have to descend to a, an agreed rendezvous, po- rendez- rendezvous point. Wow. Which he's a- agreed a week prior. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, a, you know, a couple of thousand metres yeah. further wow. down the valley. Wow. Okay, that's fine, but John and I can't walk. So the cook's going to carry me. <laughs> and the kitchen, the other two kitchen boys are going to carry John. <laughs> so we've got to leave base camp the next day with the bare minimum of supplies. Yep. So I literally, I'm, I'm dressed in my thermals, top and bottom, long, long thermals, and a down jacket and a beanie, and these big oversized slippers, if you like, because my feet are in bandages. Yep. John's much the same. Uh, pa- and you're in pain. Yes, in pain. Uh, we've got a bit of morphine with us, because John, being the doctor, had some morphine. Yep. It took the, took the edge off the pain, I think, from memory. Um, and I get my camera, my exposed film, my passport and my wallet, and it goes in a little pack on my back. Yep. And off the next day, off we go. What about your bags of cash? I don't think there's much left by then. If, uh, yes, yes, there wouldn't have been much left, but we took what cash we had, but it, it wasn't much left. And off we go. I'm getting carried, and it's it's really rough terrain. It's it's not smooth. It's yep. boulders, and so I, I, my poor the poor the poor guy carrying me is falling over, and his legs are going down holes, and mm. I'm thinking, oh, this is this is bad. At about lunchtime on the day we left base camp, it starts to snow, and it doesn't stop, <laughs> <laughs> and it just keeps snowing. And it keeps snowing to a point where we're not going to get to the rendezvous point. Fortunately, we've got a tent. We've got two tents. And our lovely base camp staff put up a tent and chuck John and I in it. And they go in the other tent and they've bought a stove. And the snow just keeps falling and falling. And... Just before sunset, just before, yeah, just somewhere during the night, about 7 o'clock at night, they come to our tent with some soup. And I'm thinking, this is incredible. We're in a blizzard and all they care about is us. Then they bring us some rice and what they call dal, which is like a light curry made out of lentils. John and I couldn't eat much, but we really appreciate the effort these guys have gone to. Yeah, Above and and beyond. That's Above above and beyond. And it is a blizzard. Yep. That's kindness. Uh, and it it became known as the October Storm of 1987. It just caused havoc. 
It's a big storm when it gets its own name. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a big it's a, storm. When anyone it, talks about Octo- the October storm in 1987, they know it. Right. Because it dumped metres. Wow. In fact, so much snow fell that night that when, we, when John and I became aware that it was morning, we were completely buried. The tent's completely under it, And our tent stands a metre and a half high. <laughs> wow. And we're buried. And we can't do anything about it. And I have no doubt that even today that we would have suffocated if we hadn't been acclimatised to 8,000 metres. Yeah, right. Yeah. And we could, and then we start hitting the walls of the tent because our, our base camp staff are also buried. <laughs> oh, God. But they were able to keep their tent partly uncovered right. throughout the night because they could do something about it. We couldn't because we couldn't use our hands. Yeah. Yep. And so I'm sort of bashing the side of the tent with the back of my hand, but I've got a pocket knife. In my cl- in my jacket, you can't use but it, but I can't open it. Oh. <laughs> now I'm thinking, will I break some teeth trying to open this pocket knife? Because uh. I can't. I, John can't use his hands, his fingers. I yeah. can't use my fingers. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm staring at this pocket knife, and then John takes over the bashing on the the inside of the tent to let us staff know that we're buried. But then we start to hear them digging. And then, of course, the more they dig, they they find the top of the yep. tent, and they yep. dig down to find the door of the tent. And when they open the door of the tent, you just hear this—you can feel this air <laughs> rush yep. into the oh, tent. Wow! So they, they literally pull us out of the tent, and uh, yeah, another day. That yeah. alone is an ordeal. And then you still got—and we're we're buried in meters of snow. And I'm thinking, okay. And the clock's ticking at this time too, isn't yeah. it? Because and this is the day the helicopter's supposed to arrive. Yes. And I'm thinking, okay, this is really dangerous. I can't allow my cook to continue to carry me because we just got to get out of this. So I start walking. We but we all we all start walking. John starts walking. I start walking. And the worst thing you can do with frostbite is refreeze right. what's already been frozen. And you don't have you can't put boots on. Well, I've got these slippers on. Yeah. So the the three base camp staff do the best they can. They are literally ploughing a trail through the snow, and John and I are fall, uh, following as best we can. And they do a fantastic job, but we just plough our way through the snow all day, and we don't even get to the rendezvous site. We're not even close. So again, the staff set up the tents put John and myself in one and there and the others and at, at 7 o'clock at night comes the bowl of soup. But isn't that the day the helicopters were coming? That's the day the helicopters were coming. So you... you the helicopter was coming. You thought this time you, you've missed it or...? And I th- no, I thought, well, looks like we're going we're gonna to have to walk a one month to get back to the... Oh. Oh. On these feet of mine and John's. So we got through that night. It was incredibly cold but the snow has, is not falling. It has stopped falling. So we get up the next day and we pack up and the, 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 the staff are out the front breaking trail through the snow. And then I say to John, did you hear that? He said, oh, what? And I thought, and I said, oh, it sounds like a helicopter. He said, no, nah, I didn't hear it. And then, but we, we listened and I said, John, the helicopter coming and they said you're right and then over this pass flies this helicopter wow straight out of the top of us didn't even see us and continues up the valley oh no right. <laughs> <laughs> and john and i just look at each other and said god that's just our luck <laughs> and, <laughs> and then i don't know whether john i think john it was john's idea he said oh Let's let's stamp. Out, we've got all the snow around us. Let's stamp out a big H in yep. the snow. And fortunately, we were, we were fairly close to a relatively flat, exposed area. Exposed area. And we stamped out this big H, and we can see the helicopter up the valley looking for us, just going around in circles. Yeah. In the main, uh, so we stamped out this big H, and I had a red jacket on. And I took it off, and John had a jacket on. And our staff are with us. And the helicopter comes down, and we're waving our 
my red jacket and John's waving his and the staff are going yahoo and carrying on and the helicopter goes straight over the top of us. Oh, oh no. Man. But then as we see it come down, go down the valley, maybe a kilometre, it turns around oh. and makes another sweep and goes right past us again. <laughs> And then goes up the end of the valley to base camp and then turns around and comes back down again and sees us. So third time lucky. And it's, it's, it's hovering around, so at least it can see us. And yep. then it can see, the, the pilot can see the H in the snow. And then he comes down for a landing and he lands. But at this, uh, this is, at extreme alti- this is at still at extreme altitude. So we're at the maximum pickup point for a helicopter. Right. And this helicopter has Struggling. landed. But it's literally shaking itself to Trying pieces. Trying to stall. It's stalling and the fact that it's going, the rotors are spinning so hard that it's 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 almost like it's going to stall. Is that because yeah. the air's thi- thin? So thin. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I get in and the co-pilot, s- the pilot says, it points at my pack and I think, oh, okay. It's all your photos. Photos. That's what I was most concerned about. Uh, Exposed. First thing I thought about. Exposed yeah. film, camera, passport, wallet. Yeah. He says, no, nah, out the door. So I toss it out the door. John gets in with his pack on out the door and then we're just sitting there in the back of the helicopter and it's it's just shaking itself to pieces and we I, I was really scared that we're going to crash and I must admit 20 metres off the ground I thought we were and it's just but we get off the ground and we go down the valley this narrow valley and as we go down the valley there's cloud coming up and we fly straight into this cloud. Jeez, does it stop? Man? And I'm thinking, this is how we're going to die. We just we've escaped the clutches of Kanch and Jungle, but we're just going to fly straight into the side of the valley. And so he turns around and comes back out of the cloud. Right, because he can't he can't fly can't in the cloud. See, yeah. Jeez. And I'm thinking, okay, we're going to run out of fuel now. Oh my <laughs> god. Jeez. Um. And then we're just circling around and around, and then he sees a gap. He he, he gets a he gets a glimpse through the cloud that there's a, you know, and to his credit, he flies straight through it and we do fly straight into cloud, but he must have an idea of where he's going. We break out the cloud on the other side and then we, we just sort of break out into... Through the storm. To a land side. that I haven't seen for two and a half months, which wow. is green, trees, wow. um, you know, villages, corn crops, rice crops. Yep. Uh, it's This is... You know, up in Kanchenjunga, it's such a sterile environment. Nothing yep. lives, nothing grows. And suddenly you burst out of this ocean, a cloud, yeah. and here's, an, here's a, a, another world. Wow. wow. And then we land at this pre-arranged village because he's brought a, fl- a, uh, a supply of fuel in with him and we're yep. about to run out. So that he had stashed all his fuel at this village on the way in, just these plastic containers. He'd also dropped off the co-pilot there because he knew that he was picking us up at the maximum height and that any extra weight was going to be a difference between getting off the ground and not getting off the ground. So the the co-pilot was down in this village. Who is this guy? He's a legend. Yeah. Yeah, What a guy. He was a friend of my agent's called... My agent's friend, Nima. So this this pilot was the brother-in-law to my agent, Nima. And that's the only reason... He went He's that extra risky for him, yeah. 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 Wow. So we land and they refuel, and um, the co pilot gets back in, and we fly back to Kathmandu, which is another two and a half hours away. 